شيء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أهلا وسهلا ومرحبا بكم حياكم الله يا مشايخ أهلا 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 وسهلا ومرحبا بكم بإذن الله تعالى we continue our Friday evening halaqat بإذن الله تعالى and this is our fourth majlis. We are going through the book Bidayatul Hidayah by Imam Ghazali Rahimahullah Jamil. We've covered the first part of this book. We said that this book in reality is broken up into three parts. The first part, he dealt with the matters of fiqh. Imam Ghazali dealt with the matters of fiqh. He spoke about the matter of uh, your daily routine, spoke about salah, he spoke about siyam, he discussed the matter of uh, uh, the tahara, your wudu and your ghusl, etc. He didn't talk about hajj, he didn't talk about zakah. Why? Because not every person has to pay zakah. Not every person is obliged to go and perform the Hajj. And so he does mention that as for these matters, we've left them out. Uh, you can find the information in other places, inshallah. Why? Because it's not a must upon every individual. Jamil. And uh, we saw many of his advices related to the ulama, related to people who are studying, related to the fuqaha and the jurists, etc. Jail. And very severe and very harsh he was against them. Allah musta'an for some of the evils and uh, the perils that many of them fall into. Allah Musta'an. We now move on ta'ala to the second third of this book, insha'Allah. And here he discusses the ijtinab al-ma'asi, staying away from sins. Right? Now he discusses the matters of you staying away from sins. You already know about tahara and about salah and about yomul jumu'ah and the day of Friday. You already know about these matters. The basics of that he has already covered. Alhamdulillah. Remember, he wrote this book here towards the end of his life after he wrote Ihya Ulum al Deen. Excellent. So now the second third bi idnillahi ta'ala, ijtinab al ma'asi, staying away from sin staying away from disobedient being disobedient to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jayid good alhamdulillah bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim ijtinab al-ma'asi i'lam anna al-deen shartan know that this deen is made up of two parts ahaduhuma tarku al-ma'asi wal akhar fi'l ta'at that made up of two parts. Number one, staying away from that which is haram, what is prohibited upon you. And then the second, doing the acts of worship, doing the acts of obedience, right? وَتَرَكْ الْمَنَاهِ هُوَ الْأَشَدُ SubhanAllah. And he says that staying away from the prohibited, this here is harder. This here is much harder, right? So know that the religion is made up of two parts. One of them is refraining from disobedience, and the other of them is the performance of the acts of obedience. One is you are told to do the good things, and the salah, and the zakah, and the siyam, and the make the jihad, and all of these matters. And the other one is to stay away from the sin. He says the first part is more important and more and more serious. Uh, there are other ulama who state no, that doing what you have been ordered is more important. Doing what you have been ordered is more important. Jayid. And this is a long mas'ala, especially that the ulama discuss in Ustul. For example, they give the example of Adam alayhi salam. That Adam alayhi salam fell into a sin. He did something which Allah told him not to do, which was eat from the tree. And Iblis didn't do what Allah ordered him to do. Allah told him prostrate, but he didn't prostrate to Adam alayhi salam. So Adam, he fell into something which was haram. As for Iblis, he didn't do an amr, a wajib, a fard, an order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But there's also levels of haram. And there's also levels of something being an order. Everyone has the capacity to carry out acts of obedience. Everybody can do acts of obedience. But only the truly sincere can abandon their appetites and their desires. Thus the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, the true person who makes hijrah, the true muhajir, is the one who abandons the evil, he abandons the sinning, and the true warrior is the one who also fights his passions. Al-muhajir man hajara su' wal-mujahid man jahada hawahu. 
reported in the Mustadrak of Imam Al Hakim. Sins committed with the two limbs, while they are a bounty from Allah and a trust given to you. Subhanallah. Right? So two things: the, 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 the limbs that we use to sin against Allah. Number one, they are a bounty from Allah, a ni'mah from Allah, and number two, they are an amana from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Right? وَهِيَ نِعْمَةٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ وَأَمَانَةٌ لَدِيكَ فاستعانتك بنعم بنعم بنعمة الله تعالى على معصيته غاية الكفران. And so to use the favor of Allah in sinning against Allah is the height of somebody who is who is in gratitude, somebody who is ungrateful. وخيانتك في أمانة أو دعك الله غاية الطغيان فإن فإن أعضاءك رعاياك uh, and so this is the ultimate level of ingratitude and your betrayal of the trust which Allah has placed with you is the ultimate level of tyranny. Indeed, the parts of your body, they are your subjects. And so you should pay attention on how you govern your subjects. They are under your control. Each of you is a shepherd and each of you is answerable for his flock. That the hand is part of your, your flock, your leg part of your flock, your tongue is part of your flock, subhanAllah, Jaid, your heart, your privates part of your flock, and you will be questioned with regards to all of your flocks. Allahumma'an. وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ جَمِيعٌ أَعْضَائِكَ سَتَشْهَدُ عَلَيْكَ فِي عَرَصَاتِ الْقِيَامَةِ بِلِسَانٍ ذَلِكَ يَفْضَحُكَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَلَى مَلَئٍ مِنْ خَلَائِكَ That know that your limbs, uh, they will testify against you on the plains of judgment, in the plains of judgment, with clear eloquent speech, they will speak. And they will testify against you. As Allah will expose your faults in front of the assembly of all of mankind. Allah the Most High, He says, On this day, we will seal their mouths and their hands will speak to us. And their feet will testify as to what they have earned. So the body parts will speak. Allah musta'an jayid. There's a video where these two brothers the one guy asks the other, who is your Rabb? He says, Allah. What is your deen? He says, Islam. Who is your Nabi, your Prophet? He says, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then the brother says, okay, excellent. Now I'm going to ask you the questions, but I do not want you to open up your mouth. Don't open your mouth. Don't move your lips. You must answer without moving your lips. Who is your Rabb? Hmm. Mm. Who is your, what is your deen? Mm. The guy's trying to talk, but he can't talk. The guy said, close your lips. You must not open your lips. Like that, he then says, we will be in our graves. And it is not dependent upon whether we can move our lips, whether we can move our tongue, etc. It is based upon our iman. It is based upon our faith. It's based upon us leaving that which was prohibited upon us. And it is based upon us doing what we were ordered to do. Allahumma sta'an. That is how we will speak. Allahumma sta'an. You can memorize the answers from now to the Qiyamah. It's not going to help you. Jaid in your grave. Jaid if you die before that. Allahumma sta'an. And so he then states, فَحْفَظْ جَمِيعَ بَدَنِكْ وَخُصُوصًا أَعْضَاءَكَ السَّبْعَةَ And so look after your body, look after all of your limbs, and especially seven limbs. I underline that, especially seven limbs, Imam Ghazali states. جَهَنَّمَ لَهَا سَبْعَةُ أَبْوَابِ Jahannam has seven doors. وَلِكُلِّ بَابٍ مِّنْهُمْ جُزْءٌ مَقْسُومٌ And uh, for verily, hell has seven gates, through each of which a particular group is destined to enter into. وَلَا يَتَعِيَّنُوا and the only ones designated to enter through those gates will be the ones who disobeyed Allah via these limbs. Which limbs? They are number one, the eye. Number two, the ear. Number three, the tongue. Number four, the stomach. Number five, the private organ. Number six, the hand. And number seven, the foot. These here are the seven that he's going to now discuss. 
and the sins we commit using these seven limbs. Allah Musta'an. As for the eye, it was created for you only so that you might be guided by it in the darkness. When it's dark, you open your eye, you, you, you try to figure out your way, etc., etc. Try it. That you might be helped by it with respect to your needs. That uh, by it you might see the wonders of the dominion of the heavens and the earth and you might consider the signs they contain. So protect your eye from four things, from looking at marriageable persons of the opposite gender, looking at those غير uh, mahrams, etc. Looking at uh, those women or that men, etc., etc. Jade. So he excludes uh, those who are the children and stuff like that. Right? They are too young. From looking at beautiful, from looking at a beautiful form in a lustful way, from looking at a Muslim with an eye of disdain. How are you looking? You know, you, you look at somebody like, you know, like, like, like they're worthless in front of you, right? And from being on the lookout for another Muslim's faults, always looking for slip-ups of this person, that person, etc. Right? Protect your eyes from these four matters, from looking at that which is haram, you're not supposed to look at these women and these men and all of this here, Jahid. Number two, looking at beautiful forms in a lustful manner. Number three, looking down at a person. And number four, looking for people's faults. Allah musta'an, Jahid, Allah musta'an. If we have to think about today, how many times we used our eyes for these four things that he said we should keep our eyes away from. Allah musta'an, Jayid. Number two, as for the udhun, amma al-udhun, fahfazha an tusghiya biha ila al-bid'a aw ila al-ghiba aw al-fuhsh. Save the ear from listening to any bid'a, listening to any ghiba or backbiting or fuhsh or any type of lewd talk. أو الحوض أو الخوض في الباطل or delving into falsehood or ذكر مساوي الناس or talking about the faults of people فإنما خلقت لك لتسمع بها كلام الله تعالى it was created for you so that you will listen to the kalam of Allah وسنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وحكمة أوليائه وتتوصل بها إلى استفادة العلم it was created for you to listen to the kalam of Allah did your ears listen to the kalam of Allah today? How much? To listen to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, to listen to the wisdom of the awliya, etc. And to use it to reach uh, access uh, to beneficial knowledge. So that you might reach the eternal domination and the everlasting bounty. But if you use it to listen to that which is disliked, then what was in your favor will be against you. Right? And what was meant to be a reason for your success will become a reason for your destruction. This is the ultimate loss. It was created for you to benefit from it, but you're using it against yourself. This is the ultimate loss. When ما كان سبب فوزك فصار سبب هلاكك وهذا غاية الخسران. It was supposed to be a means for you to get better, but you've used the ears against yourself, and now it's turned out as an ultimate loss for yourself. ولا تظنن أن الإثم يختص به القائل دون المستمع. Don't think that the sin of riba and all of these bad things here, it is specific to do with the person who speaks it. No, no, no. Even the one who listens. ففي الخبر, it's been narrated in the narrations. إن المستمع شريك القائل وهو أحد المغتابين. That the person who listens is also sinful like the person who speaks. And he is one of the two backbiters. There wouldn't be any backbiting if you were not there to listen. Yes or no? If you were not there to listen, there wouldn't be any backbiting. Allah Musta'an. Then number three, he moves on to the tongue. وَأَمَّا lisan. It was created for you only so that you could spend much time in the remembrance of Allah, the Most High, in the recitation of His book, so that you could guide Allah's creatures to Allah's way via your tongue and that you might express your needs in worldly and religious matters. If you then use it for other than what it was created for, then you have been ungrateful for Allah's blessings. The tongue is part of the body most able to overpower both you and other creatures. 
فقد كفرت بنعمة الله وهو أغلب أعضائك عليك وعلى سائر الخلق ولا ولا يكب الناس في النار على مناخيرهم إلا حصائد ألسنتهم. What he is basically stating that to have control over the tongue is not an easy matter. The tongue is the part of the body most able to overpower you and other creatures. The tongue overpowers people, right? People are not thrown into the hellfire on their faces for anything other due to what they harvested with their tongues. Hadith reported by Imam Tirmidhi. So struggle to gain victory over your tongue with all your might, lest it throw you on your face into the hell pit, into the pit of hell. For it has been narrated in a hadith that verily a man might utter a single word. And for this one word, he is hurled into the depths of, the, of hell a distance of 70 years. A martyr was killed in battle, and somebody said of him, how lucky he is, he has earned paradise. Prophet ﷺ said, how do you know? It might be that he used to speak of that which didn't concern him, or he was miserly over things which were no benefit to him anyway. Reported in Shu'ab al-Iman. So protect your tongue. And, and so now, subhanAllah, right? because Imam Ghazali states that the tongue is able to power, overpower people. He now goes into further details with regards to the tongue. When he spoke about the eye, he didn't go into excess details. When he spoke about the ear, he didn't go into all of this detail. But when he's talking about the tongue, he's going to go now into a lot of detail. Right? And he mentions that uh, protect your tongue from eight matters. Protect your tongue from eight matters. Number one, al-kadhib, speaking lies. Right? Allah Musta'an. Guard your tongue from lying both in seriousness and in jest. Just joking, just joking. So not let it get accustomed to lying in jest, leading you to do so in earnest. So sometimes, you know, you, you joke around a lot and in your jokes, you crack many lies and stuff like this. He's saying that eventually this might lead you to lying in other places. Indeed, lying is one of the breeding grounds of the deadly sins. Moreover, if you become known for lying, people will lose confidence in your word. They will mistrust you and they will look down upon you. If you wish to understand how despicable it is to lie, look at the lying of other people. Look, you experience it and then you'll understand how despicable, subhanAllah, right? Consider how repelled you feel by it. Your disdain for the person who lies and your judgment of his action as immoral. Do this with all of your faults, for you cannot know the ugliness of your own faults except by seeing them in others. Most certainly then, what you have found repugnant in others, they will find, they, they, the other people will also find it equally repugnant in you. And so, and so do not be content with these faults in yourself. Don't lie. Allah Musta'an. Try it. We know that when it comes to transactions, Allah mentions in the Noble Quran, they write it down. It's good. Why? Because to prevent disputes later on. But remember, by default, if I say, I've sold you this key for 10 rands and uh, you gave me 10 rand and you accept it, that's a deal done. We don't have to have it write, written down. We write it down for reference purpose if there's any issue later on. The Muslim, we go by his word, Jayid. How sad it is. That you have to ask somebody, swear by Allah. You have to ask somebody, are you sure? Are you triple sure? Are you double sure? Etc. You're not lying to me, brother. You really you're speaking the truth, etc. Allah Mustahan Jayid. The Muslim, you know, in the old days they used to say, My, my word, my, my, my word, khalas, my word, that's that's my weight. Jayid. Allah Mustahan Jayid. So the first one, line. Number two, Al Khulfu fil Wa'id. He made a promise and he broke his promise. Beware of ever promising something and then not keeping your promise. Rather, let your goodness towards people be in the realm of action without the need for words. But if you are forced to make a promise, then be careful not to break it unless you are incapable of fulfilling it or you have to do so out of absolute necessity. For indeed, breaking a promise is amongst the signs of a munafiq and repugnant character. Prophet ﷺ has stated, that the three qualities which, if they are hidden within the person, they render him a hypocrite. That uh, even if he fasts and he prays, what are these three characteristics? When he speaks, he lies. And when he makes a promise, he breaks his promise. And when he's given a trust, he betrays this trust. So number one, lying. Number two, uh, breaking one's promise. Number three, ghiba, backbiting. 
Restrain your tongue from backbiting. For backbiting is a sin more severe for a Muslim than 30 acts of adultery. This hadith here is, is, is a weak hadith, right? uh, which states that riba is worse than adultery. No, adultery, zina is worse. Right? احفظ لسانك من الغيبة فالغيبة أشد من ثلاثين زنية في الإسلام كذلك الخبر as narrated in the narrations but that hadith is not an authentic hadith ومعنى الغيبة أن تذكر إنسانا بما يكرهه لو سمعه to speak about somebody with words that if he heard it he wouldn't like those words فأنت مغتاب ظالم وإن كنت صادقا you are person who is backbiting you're an oppressor even if you're speaking the truth even if you're speaking the truth about ahmed ilia sumeya it's still backbiting and if it is a lie against them then it's slander and if it's true it's backbiting and beware of the uh, uh the the murain the the Qurra is basically like a term of the jurists and the fuqaha of old. So the scholars basically. And beware of speaking about the scholars who show off. That's what he's trying to say, right? Uh, because uh, you remember in Ghazali now, part and parcel of his project was that he wants to make the correction of the ulama. So here he's talking about those scholars, etc., who are just putting on a show. You be careful about speaking about them. Yes, they have that sin and that wrong that they are putting on a show, etc. But you don't speak about them, Jayid. You don't uh, backbite them. وَهُوَ بِأَن تُفْهِمَ الْمَقْصُودَ مِنْكَ مِنْ غَيْرِ تَصْرِيحٍ فَتَقُولْ Example, you say about them, about those scholars putting on a show. أَصْلَحَهُ اللَّهِ وَقَدْ سَاءَنِي مَا جَرَى عَلَيْهِ وَغَمَّنِي وَغَمَّنِي فَأَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ أَنْ يُسْلِحَنَا وَإِيَّاهُ Where you make dua for them, but people understand what you're trying to say. They ask you about so-and-so. Uh, Subhanallah, Allah forgive him. Allah correct his affairs. Allah make him right. So you're making dua for that person, but there's an indication there that the person is not right. right? Somebody asks, what do you think about Mulana Suleiman, Mulana Ahmed, etc.? Allah, Allah forgive him. Allah guide him to the right way. Uh, people understand now, Jayid, you know, that type of dua that you made for him indicates that there's, there's, there's fi shay, there's something about him, Jayid. Allahumma When you speak like this and you make dua for a person in that manner, so people understand what's between the lines, Jayid. So there's two evils in it. Number one, there's riba. إِذْ حَصَلَ بِهِ التفهم, Because people understood what you, what you meant. والآخر تزكية النفس والثناء عليها بالتحرج والصلاة and also you like throwing up yourself may Allah grant him خير may Allah forgive him may Allah put his affairs right may Allah you know when you make dua like that for that type of person جيد then you trying to make تزكية of yourself that you know you are better than that guy etc etc so you made ghibah of him and also you put up yourself Allah مستعان جيد ولكن إن كان مقصودك من قولك أصلحه الله دعاء فادعو له في السر. If you really meant a dua for that person, when you said may Allah correct his affairs, then do it privately. Do it privately. Then you really mean that dua. جيد. وإن غ تممت بسببه فعلامة أنك لا تريد فضيحته وإظهار عيبه. جيد. If you really were concerned about him, the proof of that would have been that you would not have desired to disgrace him or reveal his faults. However, your display of concern over his fault is in reality a display of his fault. If you really were concerned about him, you would have hidden this fault of his and made dua for him privately. But the fact that you spoke about it and you made this like dua in public for him, about him, etc., it shows that you're not concerned about him, but rather you want that his fault be known by the people. Allahumma sta'an jayid. Wa fi izharika al-gham bi'aynihi Sufficient as a deterrent for you against backbiting are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let not some of you backbite others. Would you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُ No, you wouldn't like to do such a thing, Jayid. 
So while well, speaking bad about somebody is like eating the dead flesh of your brother. وَيَمْنَعُكَ مِنْ غِيبَةِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ أَمْرٌ لَوْ تَفَكَّرْتَ فِيهِ And there is a matter which would stop you from backbiting against Muslims if you were to ponder about it. Turn to yourself and consider. Is there no flaw in yourself? Do you not have any flaws, apparent or hidden? Do you not have any problems, any flaws, any mistakes? Any blemishes, any sin, etc. Do you not have? Are you committing any act of disobedience to Allah? hidden or open, are you? If you know this to be true about yourself, that you do have errors and problems and issues, they know that other people, they know also that the other person's inability to free himself from what you ascribe to him is the same as your own. Just like how you also commit sins and stuff like that. Now you are looking down upon that guy because of the sins that he has. Just like how you can't rid yourself of that sin. He also probably can't rid himself of that sin. So why are you picking on him? Just as you hate to be shamed and your faults to be mentioned, so too does that person. And yet, if you conceal his faults, Allah will conceal your faults. If, however, you disgrace him, Allah would let loose upon you sharp tongues. People will speak about you, ruining your honor in this world. Then Allah, the Most High, will shame you in the hereafter in front of all of the creation. If you have looked at the outward and the inward aspects of yourself, and not found any flaw or deficiency. MashaAllah, you got no flaws whatsoever. Neither in religious nor worldly affairs. They know that your ignorance of your flaws is the highest level of stupidity. SubhanAllah. Look at Imam Ghazali. SubhanAllah. Jail. He says, do you not have any sin? You do. Okay. So that guy has. Just like you don't want yours to be mentioned in public. He doesn't want his sins to be mentioned in public. First masala. Second one. Oh, you say you don't have any sin, mashallah. You don't have any flaws. You don't have any hidden or apparent sin. Oh, then he says, the fact that you're unable to find your own sins, this is the highest level of stupidity. And there is no greater flaw than the stupidity. Allahumma Jaid. So he says, وَإِن نَظَرْتَ إِلَى ظَاهِرِكْ وَبَاطِنِكْ فَلَمْ تَطَّلِعْ فِيهِمَا عَلَىٰ عِيبٍ وَنَقْصٍ فِي دِينٍ أَوْ دُنْيَا فَاعْلَمْ أَنَّ جَهْلَكَ بِعُيُوبِ نَفْسِكْ أَقْضَحُ أَنْوَاعِ الْحَمَاقَ وَلَا عِيبَ أَعْظَمُ مِنَ الْحُمْقِ Allah Musta'an. Walau arad Allah Ta'ala bika khayran, labassaraka bi'uyubi nafsik. If Allah wanted good for you, Allah would show you the sins and the problems and the uh, defects that you have. Faru'yatuka nafsaka bi'ayni rida, ghayatu ghawa ghaba watika wa muntaha jahlik. SubhanAllah. If Allah the Most High wills good for you, if Allah wanted good for you, He would have given you the ability to see your own flaws and your faults looking at yourself with an eye of satisfaction that mashallah all is good you're looking at yourself like this is the height of foolishness and the epitome of ignorance Subhanallah. if however you are truthful and sincere in your opinion then show gratitude to allah the most high don't ruin this blessing by slandering others and selling their reputations for that is one of the greatest of faults Allahumma then he moves on to number three So he spoke about number one, the matter of uh, the matter of the eye, then the matter of the ear, then the matter of the tongue. Within the tongue, he spoke about lying. He spoke about breaking your promise. He spoke about riba, and now he moves on to number four, al mirau wal jidalu wa munaqashatu nas fil kalam. Disputation, argumentation, debating with people. You just want to argue with people and debate with people all the time. Allahumma He posts something and then somebody comments on Facebook and then somebody else comes and somebody says this. And subhanAllah, the whole day is gone back and forth with this person, that person. Ya Allah, Allahumma Jayid. These things entail harming the one being addressed, making him feel ignorant. You make people feel ignorant. You criticize them as well as you praise yourself and attesting to one's own superiority in both intelligence and in knowledge. You throw yourself up and you throw others down. Moreover, these things disturb the clarity and peace your life in your life. Uh, because if you debate with a fool, he will annoy you. 
you'll be annoyed. Your blood pressure will rise. And if you debate with a more intelligent person, he will look down upon you and detest you. The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever leaves quarreling while he is in the wrong, Allah will build for him a house on the outskirts of paradise. And whoever leaves quarreling and fighting and debating while you are right, Allah will build for him a house in the highest parts of paradise. You should not allow shaitan to deceive you when he says to you, speak the truth clearly and do not uh, dissemble. Beware of shaitan. Tells you know, speak the truth and this and that. In reality, he's trying to pull you, Jade. He's trying to pull you. Do not become a laughing stock of shaitan, letting him ridicule you. Making the truth clear is a good thing when done with somebody who will accept it from you. This is the best, this is best accomplished by way of honest sincere counsel not a disputation when you're disputing in front of somebody there on a whatsapp group or you're arguing with somebody on facebook etc even if you're speaking the truth it's very difficult for the other individual to accept it from you right? the nafs there's other people listening and there's other people chatting there etc and each one wants to protect their nafs and they want to ensure that their nafs is not put down but if you privately message the person they might be more accommodating and the chances of them accepting much higher. And when you are offering nasiha, there's a proper manner and form to give nasiha. And it requires gentleness and courtesy. Otherwise, it turns to humiliation of the other person. And it's evil outweighs all types of good within it. And the person who mixes with the pseudo jurists, so he's talking about the pseudo ulama, right? They think that they are ulama, but they are not ulama of his time, will find his nature increasingly dominated by disputation. And if you are mixing with these pseudo scholars and pseudo students of knowledge, you will find all the time there's disputes and arguments and and, and silence becoming difficult for a person. This is because corrupt scholars have influenced him to believe that such arguments, uh, there's good in it, and there's merit in it, and there's khair in it. And that skill in debating and competing with people and debating with people uh, all of this here will earn you a lot of praise. Flee from these scholars who tell you that this is good. Run away from them as you would from a lion. And know that such disputation is a means of incurring both hatred of Allah and of the creation. If this was somebody who was 20 years old and is giving advice like this here, you know, you take it with a pinch of salt. This is Imam Ghazali, Jayid, at the end of his life, subhanAllah, Jayid. He was being there, done that, got the t-shirt, etc., etc. He was like, you know, as we said, like one of the Harvard University professors. He was the main teacher at the Nizamia College in Baghdad. He taught at the Nizamia College in Nisabur. His teacher was Imam al haramin al-Juwaini, Jayid. So he says, leave off all of this debating, etc. Flee from it like you flee from, like you flee from a lion. Then number five, with regards to protecting your tongue, ascribing goodness to oneself. Ah, mashallah, you know, you, you're always praising yourself. Jayid. Allah states, Don't ascribe goodness to yourself. Allah is the one who knows who is the one who has more taqwa. Somebody was asked, one of the wise people were asked, uh, what's this? What's the, uh, what is something which is true, but it is evil? And then he said, a person praising himself. So beware of getting accustomed to doing this. Know also that it decreases the esteem in which people hold you. No doubt. When you praise yourself, the people around you, they, they, they look down upon you, Jayat. When, when you are amongst people and you praise yourself, you lose respect in the eyes of the people around you. You are praising yourself in the hope that people will respect you more. But what happens? You get the opposite. When you are always, I, 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 I did, I did, I did, mashallah, ana, ana, ananiya, ananiya. 
I did this, I wrote that, I told them, I told this one, I did. You, you lose respect in the eyes of the people. Know also that it decreases the esteem in which people hold you and it causes you to be detested by Allah, the magnificent and the majestic. And if you wish to understand how praising yourself does not increase you in any esteem with others, consider how you feel when your contemporaries praise themselves for their merits. So if you're sitting with somebody else and he's busy praising himself, uh, and, he, and he, I, I did this and I passed that and I got this tazkiyah and I went to study with that sheikh and I sat with this sheikh there and I did this and I invented that and I got this mark and that mark, etc. When you hear them saying that stuff, they lose respect in your eyes, yes or no? So he says the same, the same here, Jayid. Uh, when, when you hear them, those who are rich, etc., I bought this new watch and it's 20,000 and I did this and I went there and we took the whole family, mashallah, we went to New York, we went for holiday, we went for, you know, because, you know, you know some people, subhanAllah, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, Salman said, you know, it's holiday time and we must take the children, we must go and we went overseas and, you know, we must stay in first class and we must travel first class and we must stay in five-star hotel. And uh, have you been to, uh, have you gone for Hajj 10 times and have you gone for Umrah 20 times and have you gone to New York and London? When you're talking like this in front of people, you lose the respect of the people. And so if you hear somebody talking like this, they lose respect in your eyes. So you don't do the same. When you hear them talking about their merits and their rank and their wealth, how your heart disapproves of it, how your nature finds it unbearable, and how once you are away from them, you criticize them for that. Oh, Marshall, look at that guy. Always oh, we sat with him 15 minutes. 20, we sat with him 15 minutes. 12 minutes, he was only talking about himself. That's how people will talk about you. So why do you do that? And then why do you want to do what you criticize other people for doing? Allah Musta'an, Allah Musta'an. You should realize that when you praise yourself, they too revile you in their hearts while they are with you. And then when, you part, when they part from you, they give voice to their feelings. Allah Musta'an. You can see the Imam Ghazali was a doctor of the heart, subhanAllah. And he mentions, remember Imam Ghazali, the second crisis he had in his life, etc., was to do with sincerity was to do with ikhlas. He says, have I really been doing this for Allah? Or have I been doing it for the praise of the people and for money and jah and position and authority and to be close to the rulers and I'm there with the rulers and I'm in the palace, etc. And so he left everything. Try it. Number six, cursing. We use our tongues for cursing. فَإِيَّاكَ أَن تَلَعَنَ شَيْئًا مِمَّا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مِنْ حَيْوَانٍ أَوْ طَعَامٍ أَوْ إِنْسَانٍ بِعَيْنِهِ Beware of cursing anything which Allah has created, whether it be a human being or food or another, uh, or an animal. جَعِيد أَوْ تَقْطَعَ شَهَادَتَكَ عَلَى أَحَدٍ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْقِبْلَةِ Bishirkin or kufrin or nifaq, or that you say that so and so is a kafir or so and so is a munafiq or so and so is a, uh, is a mushrik, right? uh, somebody who is uh, one of the Muslims, somebody from Ahlul Qibla, people of the Qibla. فَإِنَّ الْمُطَّلِعَ عَلَى السَّرَائِرْ هُوَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فَلَا تَدْخُلْ بَيْنَ الْعِبَادِ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ And so be careful. Be careful of uh, saying that so-and-so is a mushrik or a kafir or a munafiq. Indeed, the only one who sees the secrets of the hearts is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you don't come between Allah and his slaves. When Yom al Qiyamah, it will not be asked from you, why didn't you curse so and so? Why didn't you swear so and so? Trade? Uh, trade? Or why were you silent with regards to so and so? Why were you silent? Why didn't you curse him? Why didn't you talk bad about him? Right? We mentioned in the uh, lecture that we put together on the life of Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, that uh, one of the issues that uh, Imam Ghazali he was uh, asked about, that uh, are we allowed to curse Yazid? Yazid, the son of Muawiyah, uh, the one who many hold responsible for the slaughter of Hussein, the killing of Hussein, radiallahu ta'ala. And so are we allowed to curse Yazid? So Imam Ghazali said no. Yazid at the end of the day was a Muslim and I say you don't curse him, you don't know how he died, etc. So you had many ulama criticize Imam Ghazali 
because he said that I don't deem it permissible to curse Yazid, right? And so here again, he talks about, you will not be asked by Allah on your Qiyamah, why, why didn't you curse so-and-so? Right? You wouldn't be asked about that. Moreover, if you never once in your entire life cursed Iblis, right? If you never did that, or ever make mention of him, you will not be questioned about it. Even Iblis, you don't have to say, Allahumma al-an Iblis, Allahumma al-an Iblis, Allahumma al-an Iblis. You don't have to make like a tasbih, oh Allah curse Iblis. You don't need to do that, right? And if it is the worst of all, and if you don't do it for him, you will not even be asked about it. Why didn't you curse Iblis? But if you curse someone, you will be held responsible for it and you will be questioned about it. Do not find fault with anything in Allah's creation for the Messenger وسلم, never once criticized food that was not nice, uh, that was not good. Uh, even food that he didn't like, he just left it, but he didn't criticize it. Rather, if he liked the food, he would eat it and if he didn't, he would leave it. Number seven, supplication against the creation. Dua al khalq, making dua against the creation. احفظ لسانك عن الدعاء على أحد من خلق الله تعالى وإن ظلمك even if somebody oppressed you don't make dua against them this is his advice وكل أمره إلى الله تعالى and leave the matter to Allah ففي الحديث إن المظلوم لا يدعو على ظالمه حتى يكافئه ثم يبقى للظالم فضل عنده يطالبه به يوم القيامة because it has been mentioned in the narrations, verily the oppressed one will pray against the oppressor until he takes his right. And then continues to the point where the oppressor has a claim over him, which he will, be demand, which, which he will demand on the day of judgment. And he mentions that some people, they spoke out against Hajjaj. Hajjaj, right? Hajjaj was responsible for the killing of so many Muslims. Hajjaj was one of the Umayyad dynasty generals. فَقَالَ لَهُ بَعْضُ السَّلَفِ And so some people were talking bad about Hajjaj because of all of the killing of Hajjaj. And so somebody said to this person who was talking bad about Hajjaj, إِنَّ اللَّهَ that uh, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَيَنْتَقِمُ لِلْحَجَّاجِ مِمَّنْ تَعَرَّضَ لَهُ بِلِسَانِهِ كَمَا يَنْتَقِمُ مِنَ الْحَجَّاجِ مَنْ that Allah will like sort out the people who spoke bad about Hajjaj, just like how Allah will hold Hajjaj accountable and responsible for all of the killing that he did. Allah is most just. You speaking bad about Hajjaj, you'll be responsible for that. And Hajjaj will be responsible for all of the killing that he did and Allah will hold him accountable and Allah will hold you accountable for talking bad about Hajjaj. على كل حال لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم in the six Jews of the noble Quran على كل حال this is the opinion of Imam Ghazali رحمه الله number eight المزاح والسخرية والاستهزاء بالناس jesting and ridiculing and making fun of people guard your tongue from these vices for they make you lose your face Diminishing people's respect for you, causing people to have an aversion from you and damaging hearts. They are a source of obstinate disputation and falling out with one another. And they sow hatred in the hearts. So don't make fun of anyone. If somebody makes fun of you, don't respond. And turn away from them until they talk about something else. Be of those who, when they pass idle talk, they pass by with dignity. These eight then comprise the calamities of the tongue. Nothing will help you against them except solitude, being alone, or forcing yourself to be silent, only speaking when necessary. It is said that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq used to put a small stone in his mouth, uh, which would prevent him from speaking except when necessary. He would point to his tongue and say, this is what has brought troubles upon me. This is what has brought troubles upon me. So be on the guard against your tongue to your utmost ability. For it is the greatest means of your destruction in this world and the next. SubhanAllah. Right? For it is the greatest means of your destruction in this world and the next. The matter of what? The matter of the heart. SubhanAllah. Right? The matter of the heart. Allah understand. Allah understand.
uh, the matter of the tongue, the matter of the tongue. For it is the greatest uh, destruction for you in this world and in the hereafter, the matter of the tongue. So he's covered the ears, he's covered the... Uh, He covered the eye, he covered the ear, he covered the tongue. Within the tongue, he went into eight sins of the tongue, eight sins of the tongue. Now he moves on to the button. Now he moves on to the stomach. As for the stomach, protected from eating the forbidden and even the doubtful and strive to seek out the lawful. Once you have obtained what is lawful, try to eat to repletition. What does that mean? Fahris ala and taqtasir ala madun ash-shaba'i. That you should eat before you are full. We say, I'm, I'm not yet full. I'm not yet full. Imam Ghazali says, like the hadith of one third, don't eat till you're full. Stop eating before that. For indeed, eating till you're full hardens the heart. It ruins the intellect and it hinders one's ability to memorize. Making one indolent in worship and seeking knowledge you get lazy lazy you know after eating then you need to sleep you get lazy when you eat so much try it and it strengthens eating so much strengthens one's carnal appetites and gives assistance to the soldiers of shaitan that's why the person who uh, he's not married and he's uh, got these desires he should fast why because when you satisfy your stomach then it gives rise to your sexual appetite to grow but when the stomach is not full then the sexual appetite does not grow right and you're able to uh, control uh, the sexual appetite because uh, it gives assistance to the soldiers of shaitan nobody goes out and commits zina when he's hungry right uh, so if uh, eating to your full stomach uh, from the lawful is a, imagine this. So eating a full stomach from the halal is the source of many evils. Then, then, then what about eating from the haram? If eating a full stomach of halal can be the source of uh, many evils, then what if somebody is eating to his full stomach on haram? Allah Jade, How much more evil is going to occur? Seeking out the lawful is obligatory upon every Muslim. Engaging in worship and seeking knowledge with unlawful, with haram nourishment is like building on a garbage heap. Right? It's like building on garbage, building on filth. Allah Mustain, Allah Mustain, Jayid. Faida Kanita Fis Sanati Bikamisin Hashin. If you are content with only one rough shirt for the whole year, subhanAllah. If you are content with wearing one rough shirt for the whole year and just two coarse loaves of flat bread a day, right? Obviously, we're not talking about the loaf like our loaves, Jayid. Uh, while giving up the pleasure of enjoying the best of condiments and seasonings, then you will not be short of what is lawful in an amount that will suffice you since what is lawful is plentiful. If you have contentment, contentment with what one garment, etc., Jayid, and you've got some bread, uh, and you, what tarakta taladud bi apa bi bi udmi. لم يعوزك من الحلال ما يكفيك فالحلال كثير وليس عليك أن تتيقن باطن الأمور It's not your responsibility to attain certainty about obscure matters with regards to lawfulness but you are obliged to guard against what you know to be haram You don't need to like well, well, you know what's you know going into like uh, super levels of scrutiny right? You need to stay away from those matters which are clear that they are haram. Uh, or what you reasonably suspect to be haram based on a clear indication that uh, is associated to the wealth. فَأَمَّا الْمَعْلُومَ فَظَاهِرٌ وَأَمَّا الْمَظْنُونَ فَبِعَلَامَةٌ 
that which is known to be haram, it is clear and plain. And that which is suspected to be haram for some reason includes the wealth of a ruler, right? Because the wealth of a ruler comes via halal source, comes via haram sources, etc. Sometimes they just take unlawful taxes from the people. And his government officials, the wealth of, uh, so these are uh, suspect types of wealth. The wealth of one who has no income except from the sources such as professional mourning in the olden days. When somebody passed away, they would hide some, hire somebody to come there and cry and make people cry. The sale of alcohol, riba transactions, uh, or the playing of flutes, musical instruments, such that you know with certainty that most of this person's wealth is unlawful, right? So somebody, he doubles in these type of uh, sales or these type of uh, uh, income. Therefore, whatever wealth you acquire from such people, even if there is a possibility that it might be from halal portion, it is still considered unlawful due to the greater likelihood of it being unlawful. There's shubha, there's a doubt there, right? So best if you stay away from the wealth of those people. Uh, another completely unlawful source of wealth is that which is taken from religious endowments, oqafs without being in accordance with its stipulation. Example, they made a waqf there, and the beneficiaries of this waqf must be the huffaz of the noble Qur'an. You're not a hafiz of the Qur'an, but you are eating from that waqf. There's a waqf there that the people who should stay in this building are the ones who are studying fiqh. You're not studying fiqh. You're studying geography, but you go and stay there, trade. That uh, this waqf here, uh, the benefits of it should be given to orphans. You're not an orphan, but you are taking from there. So any well taken from a law school or, for example, uh, by one not training to become a jurist is completely unlawful. Maybe this uh, school or this madrasa was set up as a waqf for those who are studying fiqh. But you're not studying fiqh and you go there. You can't eat from that waqf. Likewise, well taken in the name of Sufism from an endowment of other charity established to support Sufis. Maybe there's a waqf there and this waqf here is to have and uh, to support and it's a place where these Sufis can stay. But you're not from them and you want to go and stay there and benefit from staying there. You can't. By one who has committed a crime severe enough for his testimony before court to be rendered illegitimate is also unlawful. We have mentioned sources of doubtful and unlawful income in one of the chapters of revival of uh, revival of the religious sciences, which you should consult. For indeed, a knowledge of lawful sources of income and seeking them out is obligatory upon every Muslim, just as praying the five daily prayers is an obligation upon every Muslim. As for the next one, the farj, the private part. As for the private part, guard it from everything that Allah the Most High has forbidden, and be like those whom Allah the Blessed and Most High has said, and those who guard their private parts, except from their spouses or from those whom their right hand possesses. For in that case, they are not blameworthy. And you will not be successful in guarding your private parts except by guarding your eyes from looking, your heart from contemplating, and the stomach from doubtful and haram food, and from eating to your full. For these things stir one's desires and are the places where their seeds are sown. You don't protect your gaze. You eat that which is unlawful or doubtful. You eat a full stomach all the time. Try it. Then this is where the seeds for the evil which is committed with the privates are sown. As for the feet, the next one. As for the hands. Uh, do not use them to strike a Muslim, to receive unlawful wealth, to harm any of Allah, the most highest creation, to betray a trust of a Muslim or to ruin something placed in your care. Do not use them even to write something which is haram to say, for indeed the pen is one of the two tongues. Guard your pen from what you must guard your tongue from. The next one, the feet. As for the feet, do not use them to walk towards what which, which is haram, nor to approach the door of an oppressive ruler. Don't go to the doors of the sultans and the oppressive rulers. Going to an oppressive ruler without necessity or compulsion is a transgression against Allah. For it is a form of humbling oneself before them and honoring them. And you shouldn't do that. He's an oppressive ruler. Why are you honoring him? While Allah the Most High has commanded us to stay away from them. It also serves to increase the rank and the position of this corrupt ruler. And it aids them in their oppression. If it is done in order to seek wealth from them, 
then it is to aspire to what is forbidden, haram. Verily, the Prophet ﷺ said, two-thirds of a person's faith leaves him if he humbles himself to a righteous, wealthy person to benefit from his wealth. Two-thirds of a person's faith leaves him if he humbles himself to a righteous, wealthy person to benefit from his wealth. Right? Uh, this statement applies to a wealthy person who is righteous. So what do you think about a wealthy person who is unjust and he's a zalim and like a ruler, etc., etc., who is unjust? In short, the movement and the stillness of your limbs are bounties that Allah, the Most High, has bestowed upon you. Don't use these limbs to make the slightest move in the disobedience of Allah, the Mighty and Majestic. Rather, you should use them in Allah's obedience. Know that if you fall, for, if you fall short in this task, you will bear the penalty. Whereas if you roll up your sleeves and you work hard, you will taste the fruit of your efforts. Indeed, Allah has no need of you or your deeds. Rather, every soul is held in pledge for what it does. Take care not to say that Allah, the Most High, is all generous and ever merciful, and Allah forgives the sins of the transgressors. Uh, Allah is ghafoor rahim and you continue to make sin, etc. This is a truthful statement, but it's used incorrectly. It's used wrongly. The one who does so is to be branded a fool according to the criteria of the Prophet Sallallahu who said, the intelligent person is he who takes account of himself and he works for what will come after death. And the foolish person is the one who follows his inclinations and his desires and he has false hopes in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Know too that this statement of yours resembles the statements of those who wish, uh, who wishes to become a scholar of religious sciences, yet he engages in frivolous activity. All the way he says, that Allah is the most high and Allah is the most generous and Allah is capable of pouring knowledge into my heart and knowledge into my mind. Just like how Allah poured it into the hearts of the prophets without me making any effort or reviewing or studying or anything like that. You think it's going to happen? It's not going to happen. So similarly, why do you say and you commit sins morning, evening and night and you say Allah is ghafoor rahim and Allah will forgive, Allah will forgive. Try it. Allah but nobody says, well, you know what? Uh, uh, Allah will just give me money and make me rich, etc. Allah will make me a scholar. I don't need to go and study and make an effort. It also resembles the statement of the one who desires wealth, yet he does not engage in farming or commerce or any uh, gainful occupation. He remains without employment and he says that Allah is uh, all generous and Allah uh, owns the treasures of the heavens and the earth and Allah is able to uh, make me come across a treasure which will free me of any need to go and earn a living. Maybe one day I'm walking and I will find a treasure. Hey, does anyone say this? For truly, he has done that for some of his slaves. Yes, there were miracles for some people, etc. But you, you think that's going to happen to you? If you heard these two men speaking, you would think them to be stupid. And you would make fun of them. Even though their description of Allah's generosity and Allah's power, it is true and it is correct. In the same way, the people of religious insight may deride you when you demand forgiveness while you are doing nothing at all towards that forgiveness. For Allah the Most High has said, man will have nothing but what he strives for. You need to make effort in seeking that forgiveness. And he mighty and majestic also says, you are rewarded only for that which you used to do. And Allah also says, verily those who do good will be in the garden of ease. If the human being relying on Allah's generosity and might and majesty um, uh, and the mighty and majestic uh, does not abandon his efforts in the realm of seeking knowledge and livelihood. Likewise, just like how you don't stop studying and you don't stop making an effort in business, you continue doing that. Similarly here, you should not abandon your efforts in trying to get your provision in the next life. Do not be deceived, for verily the Lord of this world and the next is one. He is in both worlds, Allah, the all generous and the all, merciful, all merciful. His generosity does not increase by his providing for you. Rather, his generosity is only in his facilitating for you your path to reach the everlasting dominion by giving you patience to abandon your sensual desires for a few days. This is the epitome of generosity. So do not talk yourself into believing the clamor of those who are idle. Rather, follow the people of the highest commitment and intelligence, the prophets, the truly sincere, the righteous. 
Do not seek to reap that which you have not sown. How do, how do you expect? You haven't sown it. How are you going to reap it? It is greatly to be hoped that whoever has fasted, prayed, and truly struggled and had consciousness of Allah, this person will be forgiven. He then says, وَهَذِهِ جُمَلُ مَا يَنْبَغِي أَنْ تَحْفَظَ عَنْهُ جَوَارِحَكْ الظَّاهِرَةِ And these are the summary of that which you must protect your, your outward limbs. The actions of these outward limbs are the result. The actions of these outward limbs are the result only of the quality of the heart. Ah, subhanAllah. Jahid. So he says now that the protection of all of these limbs and all of this here, etc., uh, it is uh, dependent upon the heart. So if you wish to protect your outward limbs, you must purify your heart. For that is the inner aspect of consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, فَإِنْ أَرَدْتَ حِفْظَ الْجَوَارِحْ فَعَلَيْكَ بِتَطْهِيرَ الْقَلْبِ You want to protect your limbs, you need to purify your heart. فَهُوَ الْبَاطِنِ It is the innermost taqwa. والقلب هو المضغة التي إذا صلحت صلح بما سا صلح بها سائر الجسد. That if it is perfected, if it is corrected, if it is purified the heart, then the rest of the body will be purified. وإذا فسدت and if it is corrupted فسد بها سائر الجسد. The rest of the body is also also corrupted. فش دغيل بإصلاحه لتصلح به جوارحك. And so engage yourself in rectifying your heart. Because if you do so, then the rest of your limbs and your faculties will also be, will also be rectified. Alhamdulillah. So, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amat Allah, Imam Ghazali is discussing the second third of the book. He's covered now the matters of the sins of the limbs. He spoke about the eye. He spoke about, Jayid, uh, he spoke about, let's go through it again. Spoke about the eye, spoke about the ear, spoke about the tongue. And then eight sins of the tongue. Lying, breaking one's uh, promise, riba, uh, backbiting, uh, debating and arguing with people, uh, praising yourself, lying, cursing people, cursing things, making dua against other people and uh, making a mockery and belittling people try it then he moved on to the sins of the of the of how we talked about protecting of the stomach try it and uh, how the stomach is left linked to other other limbs of the body then he spoke about the privates then the two hands then the two legs try it and after covering the two legs then he ends off and he says that the protection of all of these are dependent upon the protection and the rectifying and the purification of the heart. And so then he will begin the matters related to the heart. Uh, we will cover the matter of the heart in our next majlis. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us khair and barakah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to record our sitting in our scales of good deeds. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our limbs to protect our hands and our feet and our eyes, the eye, the eye is the heart to the heart, is the eye is the, is the window to the heart, the window to the heart, Allahumma our tongues, and we ask Allah to forgive all of the sins that we've committed with these limbs. In our wudu, we hope that our sins committed with these limbs are wiped away. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us khair and barakah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Unite us in the company of the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannatul Firdaus. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and keep us blessed. All those Muslims, our brothers and sisters who are ill, who are going through difficulties, who are going through uh, disasters and trials and tribulations. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease their affairs. Hada, hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka abdihi wa rasulihi Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Jazakum Allah wa khayran. هذا هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك لعبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.